many of you are familiar with uh, Vincent Van Gogh? You heard of, him, heard of him before? All right, so I did a little bit more reading about him just to make sure that uh, I knew who he was before I was going to stand in front of a group of people and be recorded and presented on the internet uh, to make sure that I, I wasn't just blowing smoke. But uh, this, this uh, artist from France was uh, in the late 1800s, and he became popularly known for a number of his uh, paintings that were like uh, very emotionally charged images. You might recognize um, several of his famous works, including Starry Night. Uh, so even if I just say that phrase, uh, sometimes a, a picture would come to mind in, in regard to uh, the painting Starry Night with all the swirls in it and all the color, or the uh, self-portrait that he did with a bandaged ear. And uh, So there, there's kind of a story that goes along with each of those particular uh, paintings that he did. And, and undeniably, Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh had this uh, skill that was just unmatched by a great number of people. Nobody could uh, look at what he did and say, like, oh man, that's terrible. But the artistic community didn't really accept some of the things that he was painting while he lived. And uh, so he would create these works of art, and he would show them to people, but they weren't really embraced until after he died. And he wasn't selling a whole lot of his art. He wasn't uh, becoming really famous until after his death, which meant when he got to the end of his life, as far as he was concerned, he, he saw himself as really an unaccomplished artist, somebody whose life felt like it amounted to nothing from his perspective here. Um, he struggled throughout his life with issues of mental health, like a lot of people do. He faced uh, anxiety, and it was just, it was crippling anxiety. He, he struggled against depression. We even read uh, some accounts about his life uh, from these letters that he wrote back and forth with loved ones about how he experienced uh, seasons of psychosis. So the, the mental health concerns, these challenges that he faced were, were really strong and really tough. I mean, each of us knows what it feels like to be anxious at times or depressed at times, but for him, it was this ongoing cyclical problem that just kind of went from bad to worse. And on top of his mental health concerns, he also had physical health issues. Uh, he experienced seizures, really bad seizures. And the time frame makes it a little bit difficult for us to diagnose since it was in the late 1800s. But um, based upon what we have recorded about these seizures that he had, a lot of people think he had epilepsy. So a disease uh, that he wasn't able to cure, that he was barely even able to treat, because at that time there weren't really a whole lot of uh, medicines that were available for people with epilepsy uh, to take care of that problem. And so what did he do? He turned to alcohol, and alcohol was not helpful, not helpful for his uh, mental health. It was not helpful for his physical health. Uh, really, it complicated a lot of things and made things even worse uh, for him. As he interacted with himself, as he interacted with other people, it put a strain upon his relationships, and he really started abusing alcohol. And then all of these things combined, his mental health concerns, his physical health concerns, his alcohol abuse and addiction, uh, that all compounded to the point where he wasn't able to work. And you know when you don't work, you don't make any income, right? So what happens when you're not making any income? You become financially dependent upon others. And that was what it was like for Vincent. He was financially dependent upon his dad, upon his brother, and that added all this stress, this real strain onto his relationship that he had with them. So he's got mental health concerns, physical health concerns. He has this ongoing struggle against alcoholism, and then he's got these strained relationships in his family. And all of this just kept adding and building, like snowballing out of control to the point where Vincent eventually lost hope. He didn't see a solution. He didn't feel like, okay, well, you know, if I can just get through this ne next tough week or this next difficult season, as far as he was concerned, it was never going to get better. And so at the age of 37, he completed suicide, dying at such a young age, a person who had fantastic potential. I mean, just look at this painting that's displayed here, not the one on the right, that was a joke, but the one on the left, the Starry Night painting, one of his most famous works. Uh, and, and any of his works like this were, were visually stunning in a very similar fashion, but when he looked at himself, he didn't see somebody who amounted to something. He didn't see like, okay, well, it'll get better tomorrow or next week or next year. And he gave up. He gave up. You've faced difficulties too, some of them similar to Vincent. Um, maybe not exactly the same, but each of us knows what it is like to face illness. And sometimes our illnesses aren't short-lived. When the doctor comes and says to you, oh, you'll probably get better in four to six months, you're thinking four to six days would be a long time for me to feel sick, right? Four to six months or four to six years or never. Uh, the prognosis is sometimes like you, you might not ever recover from whatever it is that you're facing physically, this physical illness, or financial trouble. We know what it's like to uh, come up a few dollars short when you want to get those onion rings at the fair, but you're like, oh man, I only have four dollars and they cost six dollars or whatever the case may be. But when it comes to like actual big bills, utilities and mortgage and taking care of uh, financial responsibilities, if you have this much but you need that much, then you're feeling that weight, you're feeling that pressure. And you know what, what it was like for uh, Vincent to be in that type of a, a situation there. We know what, it, what it's like to feel rejection when you put yourself out there and try to establish a relationship with somebody and they're just not open to it. Or, um, 
or the pain of having a broken relationship where something went wrong in that relationship and it, and it just fell apart and you tried to, to make it better. You tried to restore that broken relationship, but it just it hasn't happened yet. And some of us know exactly what that feels like. Have you ever felt hopeless before? Being hopeless is tough. Yeah, I see some nodding heads and some hands. It's, I'll put my hand up. I, I know what that feels like. It's, it's like there's nothing that could fix what I face right now. That's what hopelessness seems like. And I'm so thankful, so, so very thankful that God has a lot to say about when we feel that way. God has so much to speak to you and to me and to others about when we face hopelessness. In the early church, they had their ups and downs and a lot of bumps along the way. Let me just remind you of some of these things. You might already know about some of these things based upon what you've read or heard, but I'll just I'll bring them to your attention so that you can remember what these, uh, what these people in the early church have experienced just over the last couple months for them. They had uh, one of their closest friends, one of the 12, betray our Lord. In essence, metaphorically stabbing him in the back. I can't imagine what it would have felt like for the closeness of that group to experience that type of betrayal. And that led to Jesus' arrest. And when he was arrested, he's telling them, don't fight back. Don't, just, just let it happen, guys. Like, well, what do you mean, don't fight back? I mean, we can stop this. We're armed. We're ready to go. I, I'm ready to fight for you, Jesus. And he's saying, no, no, don't fight back. And they arrest him, they take him off the trial, which, by the way, wasn't just any trial, it was a rigged trial. That's a bump in the road, right? When you're falsely accused and you're facing judgment, and it doesn't really matter what actually happened, and it doesn't really matter what's, what gets said about your situation, this trial is rigged, and it leads to torture, and it leads to murder. That's a big bump in the road for the church. So for them, not knowing what happened later, I mean, we could look back on it. We've read this. We've talked about this. We know what is about to happen on the third day. They didn't. They felt hopeless day after day after day. Imagine not knowing about Jesus' resurrection, and you just watched your best friend, your Lord, our Savior, die. And then there's nothing. It's just, it's just darkness and emptiness and hopelessness. So on that third day, he did come back. He rose to life again, and we're excited and we're thankful for that, but he didn't stay. The stinker, he's like, guys, I'm back, but I'm leaving, and, and you know, we really would have liked it if he could have stuck around, I think, and he said, well, you know, when I go, it's going to be better, and we're like, yeah, right, Jesus, what could possibly be better than having you here, and you left, and then you came back, and now you're leaving again, and, and when he left, then this church that God created had rapid growth, and it was full of energy, it was full of confusion, it was full of excitement. They're trying to sort out, what are we going to do? How are we going to live out this way here? And all this rapid growth led to prison behind door number three, and they get put on trial, and, and, uh, and it just kind of seems like they just can't catch a break. So when they're thrown in prison, we talked about that before, they get ordered, you better stop talking about Jesus. You, like, he is not welcome here in this place. He is not welcome in this environment. He is not welcome in our relationship. You just need to leave Jesus somewhere else. That's what they were told. And they could have done what they were told, but they decided instead to pray to be, do you remember? Do as you're told or pray to be bold. That's right. I see your mouths saying it. A couple of us here remember that particular day. So, you know, they're, they're really trying to continue on, but facing hardship after hardship after hardship here. And, and it was like it didn't matter so much what people were saying, what sort of threats they were bringing against them. Uh, but they, were, they wanted to persist, and they, they loved the Lord, and they loved each other. And part of the way they demonstrated that love to each other was by caring for those who were in need. So we get this picture of what the church looked like when God first created it. They're taking care of each other. If you have a need, then the church is going to take care of that need. And when the church took care of that need, people were like, wow, good job. That's great. I'm so glad that you did that. I'm really glad that you came alongside this person and that you chipped in. It was wonderful that you could be a part of the solution here. And, and I like it when people say good things about me. And so what happened? Well, a couple of people decided they wanted that sort of good feeling, too. They wanted that praise, too. Not because they were actually being helpful to those who were in need. They were being hypocrites. They found this loophole that if we look like we're doing the right thing, then people will praise us and make us feel good, and we want that good feeling. And so those hypocrites paid for their hypocrisy with their life. And when we talked a little bit about those, uh, those hypocrites, thank goodness that never happened in the church again, right? <laughs> You're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, it, it creeps back in every once in a while. And, uh, and they paid with their lives. Ananias and Sapphira are the people that we're talking about. And they literally died. For us, if we're hypocrites, we might not die physically. Your heart may still be pumping blood. Your brain might still be braining. But we're going to die one way or another because hypocrisy is a form of sin. And sin only has one destination. What is it? It's death. The only destination for sin 
is death, regardless of what kind of sin it is. It always leads to death. It's disguised in its temptation so that we don't think of it as death, but it always leads to death for us. And so for this early church here, they're trying to love and care for each other here, and, and some people would receive that love, and some people would accept that news about Jesus, the truth about his life and his death and his resurrection and the salvation that he offers to us. But did everybody accept it? No. Same for you and me. Back then with the early church, not everyone would accept the truth about Jesus. And in fact, some people even would reject it with great violence. So moment after moment, problem after problem, situation after situation, obstacle after obstacle, the early church was having all of these setbacks, all of this pushback over and over again. And giving up kind of seems like an option when we experience problem after problem after problem. When you don't have a solution, like, well, I worked on it and it didn't fix it. And I prayed about it, but God didn't change it. And I made this effort, and I even asked other people to make this effort with me, but it's still just as big of a problem, or maybe, maybe even bigger of a problem than what it used to be. And giving up feels like it's an option for us. And that's what Vincent turned to when he looked at his problems and felt hopeless. He ended up just giving up. You're applying for a job, either because you don't have one or because you want something or need something different from the job you have. And you send out an application, and you send out another application, and you send out another application, and you're not getting calls back, you're not getting emails back, you're not getting interviews, and maybe you do get an interview every once in a while, but nothing comes from it. How do you feel? The temptation is there to feel hopeless. You're, you're trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to personalize this for a little bit, uh, trying to earn your driver's license and uh, you go and you take the test and you didn't get it. And you go and you take the test and you didn't get it. And you go and they take the test and you didn't get it. And then you decide, I'm riding the bus from now on because I don't want to fail the driver's exam for the fourth time in a row. How do you feel? You feel kind of hopeless. All of us know what these feelings are like when you hear from the doctor. The prognosis is, well, this is the description of what you've got or what your loved one has. And there isn't a cure for that. There isn't a pill. There isn't a shot. There isn't a surgery. Whatever the case is with this particular diagnosis, there isn't a cure for that. And you've prayed for healing. You've asked the church to pray for healing for you or for your loved one, and that healing didn't come. How do you feel? We know what this feels like because we've experienced it in one shape or another, and sometimes we just, we just give up. I mean, why even bother praying about it if it didn't happen? Why bother working on fixing that broken relationship if it didn't work out? Why bother chasing after having a relationship with someone if I just can't find that one special someone? If I try and I try and, and, and we feel like giving up here, I want you to think for a moment about something that you've given up on. And I'll give you a little moment to actually reflect on this because I don't just want to say that. I actually want you to think of something that you've given up on in your life. Ask God, show me something in my life that I've given up on, either recently or in the long past, whatever it is. But think, think about like some dream that you had. Like one day, maybe one day I'd be able to, but that dream didn't come true. And so you gave up on it or, or the, you were really hopeful for healing for yourself or for a loved one, but you just, you gave up hoping for that and you just resolved, well, I guess this is the best it's going to get when mom has dementia and it's just going to all go down here from there and you just gave up hope. Um, maybe it's for some loved one that you have that needs Jesus and you love this person and you know this person needs to know Jesus and love Jesus and follow Jesus and you try to talk with that person and you try to pray for that person and you try to speak with that person about the truth of the gospel and you've done it here and you've done it there when you get together and, and you're praying for them when they're not around and you're really, really hopeful. Like maybe this time, if I invite them to this church activity, maybe they'll come. Or maybe if I can have just that one conversation with them about what's been going on, that difficulty in their life, and I can talk to them about God, maybe then they'll, they'll place their faith in Jesus, but they haven't done it yet. And did let's be honest. I mean, did you give up? I, I know exactly what this is like, just as I reflect on my own life. And I want you to think of something in your life where you've given up on it. So ask God, show me something that I've given up on. And if nothing comes to mind, then, then I still want you to tuck this away, that what we're going to talk about here today, because it will apply later. You will, if you're not right now, and if you can't really remember in the past, but you will face a day where you will be tempted to just give up. And the truth of what God has to say about hopelessness, about this idea of giving up, is something that you're going to want to have in your pocket ready to pull out when you face that temptation to give up. For me, there have been plenty of things that I've given up on in life. Um, you know, stuff that I wasn't good at, stuff that I wasn't successful at doing, uh, hopes that I had, achievements that I strived for. Hopelessness is isolating and incapacitating and painful. It makes us feel empty. 
And I want to show you what God has to say about when we give up. So I'm going to look together with you at Acts 5. Grab your Bible or borrow a Bible if you need to, and let's turn to Acts 5. So we remember that in the book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, it's about seven-eighths of the way through the Bible. In the book of Acts, God has uh, created his church, this new church. And uh, at the beginning of that book, we're reminded that part of the purpose that God gave to the church when he created it was that we would be a witness. And a witness is someone who talks about what they know to be true. So this word witness and this concept of being a witness shows up throughout the Gospels and throughout this book Acts and also in the other parts of the New Testament as well. And that God's design, his, his deliberate plan for the church was that we would be a witness uh, to talk about the truth that we know about what happened with Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The truth about sin and the cost that we pay because of it. The truth about how Jesus offers to us forgiveness and salvation. This is what it is to be a witness, to speak about what we know to be true. And when a person becomes convicted of the sin in their life and they realize, oh boy, you know, I've done, I've done wrong uh, and I blew it, I messed up, and the end result of my sin is death and there's nothing I could do to fix that, then what should we do? And so we talked a little bit also about part of God's deliberate plan was in response to recognition of being convicted of our sin, we should repent. And we talked about be baptized. This was in chapter 2. Repent is that biblical word that means to turn away from sin, to turn to God. That's a part of what he asks for us to do. It makes sense, right? Not just, well, do it and I'll forgive you and do it again and I'll forgive you and do it again and I'll forgive you and do it again and I'll forgive you. God is gracious and I'm thankful for that. But he doesn't want us to keep sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. He wants us to turn away from it because he knows that it leads to our death. And he loves you. And he doesn't want you to be dead, to have death in your life. So then we talked about how the church demonstrated compassion. And our compassion helps people realize, what's the church like? What's God like? And compassion takes the, do you remember that one? Compassion takes the guesswork out of God, yeah, I see your mouths. You're not saying it out loud, but I can see some of you like, I remember that one, yeah. The, the way that, that part of God's deliberate plan for his church was that we would be compassionate to one another. And then when the hypocrisy rose, and we, we, uh, we <laughs> when I preached that sermon about loopholes, uh, you know, when, when a, a pastor preaches, people uh, give feedback. You know this, right? Sometimes it's like, hey, great sermon, pastor. Other times it's like, man, that was terrible. Or like, well, it would have been better if you X, Y, Z. And after I preached that particular sermon, uh, I didn't ask in advance if I could say this. I'm looking for it. Yep. I'm looking at my wife like, can I say this out loud? She goes to me, so <laughs> do you get any people mad at you yet for, <laughs> for your sermon when I talked about loopholes? Uh, she said, I was just pushing every button that there was. And I thought, well, I didn't really want to push buttons, but it's, this is what God's word says. And whether it's this loophole or that loophole or this shape of hypocrisy or that shape of hypocrisy, Jesus wants us to get rid of those loopholes, lose those loopholes, or lose our lives. And so, like I mentioned, for Ananias and Sapphira, that was literal. For us, it's usually more figurative, more spiritual, more metaphorical when we're talking about losing our lives here. And, and the church is being compassionate. The church is growing. The church is full of energy. But they get thrown in jail, and then they get out of jail, and then they get threatened, like, you better stop talking about Jesus, and they're not willing to stop talking about Jesus, and so the church is growing even more, and there's all this more excitement. And this right here in verse 17 is the context where we find ourselves. So look at Acts 5, 17. Look there with me. It says, the apostles performed, oops, wrong, wrong line, sorry. Then the high priest and his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with what? Jealousy. What's it mean to be filled with jealousy? I want what you've got. We use it kind of interchangeably with greed sometimes. Uh, these Jewish religious leaders, sometimes, you know, here it refers to them as uh, Sadducees. These Jewish religious leaders saw what was happening in the church and thought, mm, boy, that makes us feel jealous. Look at verse 18. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. And you know there's more than one kind of jail, right? You got jail, you got prison, you got house arrest. So here, this public jail, we're talking about Roman jail. The governing authority at the time, that was the Romans. They lived in the Roman Empire. You did not want to wind up in a Roman public jail. We're not talking three square meals a day and then a free gym membership to your time to go work out. No, for them, they were lucky to get basic accommodations. You might get some kind of little bit of bedding to lay on. You, you might get some food while you were in public jail. But these places were overcrowded. They were dirty. They were infested with disease. If you weren't sick before you went to jail in a Roman public jail, you were definitely sick after you went there. So you're facing injury. You're facing illness. You're facing disgusting conditions here. And, and for them to be thrown into public jail here was something that uh, was sort of like 
a, a looming danger all the time. The way that the Roman uh, Empire expanded wasn't by peaceful negotiations of like, hey, do you want to be in my club? And then, then we can have, we can, like your territory and my territory, and you too, do you want to be in my club? And then my territory and your territory, and, our, and our, it would get bigger and bigger. It wasn't like that. They would go and they would conquer places. <laughs> boom, you're destroyed, and now I'm the boss, and boom, you're destroyed. And, 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 and they would make sure that the, the way that they governed the, the Roman Empire was with power and threat and force and fear, they would get a, a political leader and put them into a spot, and they would say, uh, your job is to maintain order in this area right here. And if you're not able to maintain order in this area right here, then what we're going to do is we're going to come in with our army, and we're going to kill a bunch of people, including you, and then we're going to put somebody else in charge of your area. So constant fear of... Uh, of the power that the Roman government had over top of them. If, if you had a debt that you couldn't pay, you, like I was teasing earlier about going to the fair and not having enough cash, if you have a debt that you can't pay, jail. If you're a slave and you have an unhappy slave owner, think of all the things that could potentially make your slave master angry with you. If you have an unhappy slave master, a slave owner, and you are that slave, then where are you going to go? Jail. If you are a prisoner of war, as the territory expands, as the empire is growing bigger and bigger, and you're in one of those territories, and, and you're a prisoner of war, where are you headed? Jail. It didn't matter if you were even guilty of a crime. All you had to be was accused of having done something wrong. And you would go to, let me hear you say it, jail. Watch this video clip with me. This kind of behavior is never tolerating in Boracua. You shout like that, they, they put you in jail right away. No trial, no, no nothing. Journalists, we have a special jail for journalists. You're stealing, right to jail. You're playing music too loud, right to jail, right away. You're driving too fast, jail. Slow, jail. You're charging too high prices for uh, sweaters, glasses. You right to jail. You undercook fish, believe it or not, jail. You overcook chicken, also jail. Undercook, overcook. You make an appointment with a dentist and you don't show up, believe it or not, jail, right away. We have the best patients in the world because of jail. That's where we find the apostles. They're in jail. And we laugh a little bit when we see a video clip like that. But for them, this was not a funny moment. This was a scary moment because they didn't know what was going to happen next. They didn't know what was in the next chapter. They couldn't fast forward their way through it. They just found themselves in jail. And why were they there? For doing the right thing. They had gone to the temple courts. This was an area that was outside of the building of the temple. It's still like the area around the temple. And in these temple courts where lots of people would gather together here, they were talking about Jesus because they knew lots of people would come to the temple courts so they could interact with a whole lot of people. And in that area, in the temple courts, they're sharing the gospel. They're, they're being a witness like God has planned for the church to be, telling other people, this is who Jesus is. This is what happened to Jesus. This is what happens to us because of our sin. And this is what we can receive as a gift from him if we would place our faith in him. And when they were doing this very, very good thing there in the temple courts, they got thrown in jail. Look a little further here with me in verse 19, Acts 5, 19. It says this. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in where? Where's he tell them to stand? Say it out loud. The temple courts. That's just where they were. That's where they just got arrested. Angel, I know you represent God and the things that you're telling us are from God, but are you, are you like really sure that's where we should go? Because if I just got thrown in jail for talking about Jesus in the temple courts and then an angel comes and sets me free, I'm like, well, then I'm pretty sure it's time for me to go fishing. Not back to the temple courts again. But he's like, no, I want you to go to the temple courts here, he said. And the next part says, and tell the people all about this new life. Was the angel providing a get out of jail free card or was the angel providing a you're going to get thrown into jail again card? What does it feel like to you? <laughs> go right back to the place where you got arrested and do the exact same thing that you got arrested for. Ready? Go! But this is the instruction that the Lord gave them through that angel right there in verses 19 and 20 here, right back to the place where they had been arrested. Jail is a recurring theme through the book of Acts. So we've already seen it pop up uh, a little bit so far, a couple times, uh, the part that we've looked at here together in the last few weeks. Peter and John were thrown in jail. Stephen, the guy that I was named after, he got thrown in jail. James, Paul, big famous dude, Paul, he got thrown in jail. Silas. So like throughout the rest of the book, it's like jail, 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 over and over and over again. Look at verse 21 with me. Chapter 5, Acts 5, 21. It says this. At daybreak, so as soon as the sun hits the sky, first thing in the morning, they entered, oh, are you kidding me? They go back to the temple courts. Okay, they did what God asked them to do. Yeah, but like soak it in. Would you? 
Would you, I mean, like, I get that they went back to sleep first. That's why it says at daybreak they went. Would you go back? I don't know. I don't know if I, I mean, that would be like a really tough decision if we're being honest with ourselves. At daybreak, they went back to the temple courts as they had been told and began to do the thing that they got arrested for. It says, and began to teach the people. When the high priest, that's the Jewish leader, when the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. All right, you know, we threw those guys in jail because they were in the temple courts and they were talking about Jesus when we asked them to stop talking about Jesus and we threw them in jail, so go get them. We're going to tell them what it is. We're going to give them peace of our mind here, so go to jail and get them here. Verse 22, but... On arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. Well, duh, we know that part. They didn't. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. Can you imagine what it would be like to be one of those guards? I've been standing here all stinking night guarding an empty jail cell. I feel like an idiot. Don't tell mom. Okay, so... They're gone. It's still locked. The guards are still there acting as if nothing had happened because as far as the guards know, nothing had happened. And on hearing this report, oh, it says, but, but so I skipped a part, sorry. But when, uh, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Verse 24, on hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, Durr. wondering what this might, it doesn't say what it might mean. It says what it might lead to. I think they knew what it meant. I, I think that's why it doesn't say they're trying to figure out what it meant. They're trying to figure out what it was going to lead to. It meant that these people that they had imprisoned got out either by God's power or by Satan's power. There are no other supernatural options. So if God had empowered these people to get out of prison, then what that meant was that the people who had imprisoned them were working against God. So is that good news for the Jewish leaders? No, and they're concerned what it's going to lead to if we've been doing things against God. That's, that's convicting. Or if it was satanic power, and we know that it wasn't, but they, they were thinking if it was satanic power that had enabled them to get out of jail, somehow the door is still locked, the guards are still there, but they got out of jail. If it was satanic power that did that, then from the Jewish leader's perspective, this is still not good news for them because they know what they're up against is the enemy of our souls who is very powerful. This was a big deal for them. And so they're thinking, what is this going to lead to? Look at verse 25 then. Then someone came and said, look, the men that you put in jail are standing <laughs> in the temple courts teaching the people. That's, uh, this is hilarious to me. Verse 26, at, the end, at that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. So... <laughs> So they went up to the apostles and they're like, hey guys, um, would you mind coming with us? I want, you, I want to introduce you to my friend, the high priest. Let's go very happily over here. Do you envision that's the way that it went? I'm sure what they wanted to do was rough them up, but they didn't. And it tells us why. It tells us why they didn't rough them up here. So uh, they went and they brought the apostles. It says they did not use force because they feared that the people, not the apostles, think it through, that the people would stone them. Why are they afraid of the people? Well, that's the whole Roman government thing, because these people had taken notice of the church. These people had noticed that when these Jesus followers were around, powerful things were happening. And the Jews, they didn't understand it, and they didn't agree with it, but they could look around and see it's leading to a lot of excitement that is excessively dangerous, because if things get out of control here, what are the Romans going to do? They're going to come in, and they're going to kill all of us. So we have to get control over this and don't let it get out of hand here. They might start throwing rocks. This is a dangerous situation right here, what it might lead to. So verse 27 then. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish high court, to be questioned by the high priest. 28, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. You didn't just talk to a couple people about it. The entire city is buzzing here. Hashtag Jesus all over the place because of you stinkers that just won't shut up about Jesus. And we told you to stop talking about him. And we threatened that we were going to do to you what we did to him six weeks ago if you didn't stop talking about Jesus. But they wouldn't stop talking about Jesus here. And you would not speak in his name here. Yet you fill Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us, the Jews, guilty of this man's blood. Nobody likes being guilty. <laughs> it's a lot more fun to place blame, isn't it? He did it. It wasn't me. That's kind of what's going on here with the Jewish leaders. You're trying to make it look like we're the ones who did something wrong. Well, I hate to break it to you, Jewish 
Jewish leaders, but you did. <laughs> but really, so did we. This is not anti-Semitism. All of us are accountable for the, je- for the death of Jesus. When they were demanding Jesus' death, they cried out like a mob. They shouted, <laughs> let his, Jesus, let his blood be on us and on our descendants. We'll take responsibility for having murdered Jesus. It was the Romans that nailed him to the cross because the Jews, they didn't have the legal right to do it, so they got the Romans to do it. But this mob was like, yeah, we'll take the blame. That's us. All of humanity is responsible for the death of Jesus because when he went to the cross, it wasn't his cross. It was mine and yours. See, we're guilty. He was innocent. And he went there and died so that you and I don't have to. He took our place traded spots with us. And when he rose to life again, he offers to us this gift of eternal life. And so they're saying here, you're determined to make us look guilty of this man's blood. Look at verse 29, Acts 5, 29. We're going to reflect here and see what is the church going to do? What what are these uh, these Christians, these witnesses going to do when they're told, we told you guys to shut up, we threatened you, And you know that you're out of line. We threw you in jail last night here. Look at verse 29. What are they going to do? Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. Grab a pen or a pencil. We must obey God. I want you to have a pen or a pencil. If you're using a pew Bible, go right ahead. I want you to underline those words right there. We must obey God rather than human beings. If I get in trouble for it, I'll take the the blame. Oh, I wrote in a pew Bible. It's okay. Underline it. We must obey God rather than human beings. Verse 30, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Yep. 31, God exalted him to his own right hand. That's the position of power. To his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgiveness and forgive their sins. Why did Jesus do that? So that we would turn away from our sin, so that he could give to us forgiveness. 32, we are witnesses of these things. We speak about what we know to be true. 32, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, wait a minute. If you're paying much attention, you might be thinking to yourself, I thought that this sermon was going to be about not giving up. Because remember I talked about Van Gogh, how he gave up? And then I kind of talked about us, how we face situations where either we did give up or we were tempted to give up. Does it seem like that these Christians, this, this group, this early church here, does it seem like they gave up? No. No, they didn't, okay? So if you're thinking to yourself, well, how does this line up with the whole, like, first 10 minutes of what you said, Steve? Um, you're right. They didn't give up, and that's going to actually lead us to the one thing that I want to teach you today. But before I give you that one thing, I want to read just one little bo- more uh, paragraph here, and then I'll give you the one thing I'm going to teach you today. Look at verse 33, Acts 5, 33. It says this. When they heard this... They were furious and wanted to put them to death. No kidding. Verse 34, but a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. So mom and dad are going to talk. You guys go somewhere else in the house here. 35, then, they addressed, then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. 36, some time ago, Thutis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. That's quite, a, that's quite a gathering, right? He's saying, yeah, I'm important, I'm awesome. And everybody's like, we think you're awesome too. And you got over 400 people gathering around this guy. And what happens to him? He was killed, and all of his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. That's verse 36. Thutis, big gathering, 400 people. They think he's awesome, he thinks he's awesome. And he's push, push, pushing. And they had concern over him, and everybody there in that group, the Jewish Sanhedrin, they knew who Thutis was. And then when he gets killed, it came to nothing. Look at verse 37. After him, Judas. I love the fact that we have Thutis and Judas. But Thutis and Judas, the Galilean, appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. That warrants a little bit of explanation, actually. Um, This guy here, uh, Judas, in in history, we know him as Judas of Gamala. It's the same person. He led a revolt in 6 uh, AD against the Roman census. When you and I participate in a census, we say, this is who lives in my household, this is who I'm related to, these are the uh, uh, ages and the dates of birth and the occupations of the people who are here. Does that seem like a reason for us to revolt against the government? Mm, Probably not. So why is it that this guy decided that he was going to revolt against the census? Well, it was really difficult for a person to figure out how much taxes they owed. And it's kind of still true today. (laughs) 
But uh, because you didn't know how much taxes you owed, then when the tax guy, the IRS uh, guy from the, uh, from the Roman government comes by and says, you owe this amount of money, you gotta pay it. Because what happens if you don't pay your tax? Jail. Yeah, okay. You don't pay your tax, you go to jail. And you owe this much, but he says you owe that much, and you don't know. And if you don't pay what he demands, you're going to jail. So this is what was happening with the census here. It was about the abuse of taxes here. And so with Judas, the Galilean, he appeared in the days of the census, and he landed, led a band of people in revolt. And it says he too was killed, and all of his followers were scattered. That's verse 37 right there. Therefore, verse 38, in the present case, so Gamaliel is speaking to the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin here, says, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, what's going to happen to it? It will fail. If what they're doing, if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But, he said, if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You'll only find, your, you'll only find yourself fighting against God. What happened with those Jews? They gave up. <laughs> the church had all kinds of reasons to give up. Judas Iscariot betrayed him. Their Lord got arrested, tortured, murdered. The church grew, but then they got thrown in jail. The church grew, but then people started faking it and playing church and being hypocrites. And then they died right in front of them. And they're thinking to themselves, if this whole Jesus thing could lead to my death, I better tread carefully here over and over. Now they're thrown into jail all over again here. And if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it was from God, you will not be able to stop these men. That, I think, is a pretty good, stinking, stinking good reason for us to not give up. Here's the one thing I want to teach you today. Don't, don't miss it, okay? Don't miss it. I want you to take this home with you. Tuck it away. You need it now or you're going to need it later. Somebody is going to give up. Somebody is going to give up. Don't let it be you. Somebody is going to give up. It'll happen because junk in life happens. But don't let it be you, especially when God has asked for you to do something when God has sent you to say, I want you to X, Y, Z, either in his written word, and we are to obey him, or with his mission that he has entrusted to the church, if God has asked you to do something, people are giving up left and right. But don't let it be you. I ask you to think about something that you've given up on. And I understand this line here that's on the screen, somebody's going to give up, don't let it be you. I understand that doesn't apply to all life situations. I get it. If you were praying for a loved one who was sick to be healed, and then they didn't get healed, and then they died. I'm not hoping for like the zombie apocalypse where they'll come back and then, yay, thanks God. That's not what I'm talking about. I understand it doesn't apply in every life situation, but it does apply when God has asked you to do something every time. Because if this purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop it. So don't be the one who gives up. Somebody's going to give up. Don't let it be you. That dream that you, that you had, that dream that people said was too foolish, that dream that God placed in your heart, that maybe one day you might do something for his kingdom and you thought to yourself, wouldn't it be great? That dream that you had that you gave up on or that you're tempted to give up on, somebody's given up. Don't let it be you. The long suffering that you've experienced here as you wait for an answer some new medicine, some new procedure, some new doctor, some new diagnosis, somebody's given up. Don't let it be you. That broken relationship, it's a whole mess. You don't even want to admit that that was you that did and said those things. And it's been so long that you can't even really remember who said what or who started it. Somebody's given up. Don't let it be you. Imagine with me what God could do if we didn't give up. Just, just for a moment, picture it with me. What would it be like if when God asked us to do things and they're tough, if no matter what pushback we had in life, if we didn't give up? Can you imagine what that would be like? What if, like the apostles, we walked right back into that situation? Not back into the temple courts, but back into that thing that God has asked for you to do. And you know God has asked you to do stuff. 
You felt that in your heart. You've heard that. You've, you've caught that dream from him where he wants you to do something and you tried and it didn't work. And you, you put forth the effort and it didn't happen. What if, what if you didn't give up? Can you, can you just imagine what God could do if we said, yeah, I know somebody's given up, but it's not gonna be me. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be the one who gives up because if this is of human origin, I know it's gonna fail. But when it's of God, when we see what God has asked for you and for me to do, and we dig our heels in and say, I am not going to give up on that loved one who has rejected Jesus for decades. I am not going to give up on that broken relationship for the person that swore they would never talk to me again. I am not going to give up on what God has asked for me to do. Imagine what he could accomplish in your life and in mine in the church. Somebody's going to give up. Don't let it be you. There's one more line here in verse 42. It reads this, day after day, in the temple courts, <laughs> where were they? The place where they got arrested more than once. Verse 42, day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Never, never, never. God, it seems a lot easier to give up sometimes. Especially when the people around us and the situation around us and our spiritual enemy is just shouting repeatedly in our ear. Just curse God and die. Forget it. It's not going to happen. So many things in our lives, God, where we face pain and hardship questions and difficulty, and I pray that you would help us to sort out the difference between human endeavors and what you have asked for us to do, and that we would never, never give up on what you have asked for us to do, Lord. Our praise rises to you, God, even when our problems aren't solved. Our hope is in you, even when our situation is unchanged, and so may we place our hope in the solid foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we know in the depths of our being that if our purpose or activity is of you, that it cannot be stopped. May we never give up. Whatever it is that you've asked us to do, Lord, may we never give up. I love you.